down. <laughs> sure, that looks great on camera. Anyway, <clears throat> with that, I shall bring you a article by the late Jack Michael. It's been a tough year for behavior now. Analysts lost a lot of good ones. This guy was one of the good ones. Or maybe he was just old and we called him good because he's old. Anyway, beside the point, no, Jack's great. So here we go, was great. Ugh, that's so tough to say. I don't like saying Jack was great. Ugh. Makes me feel old. And a bit sad. All right, so anyway, Michael, 82. Distinguishing between discriminative and motivational functions of stimuli. In other words, the hardest, easiest article you've ever read. Why? Because you completely understand it, yet you don't all at the same time. Why? Because everybody knows what an SD is. No, like hell you do, Jack would say. Actually, he wouldn't say that. I say that on behalf of Jack. But the point is, is that none of us really know what an SD is, and Jack's here to point that out to us and be like, ha <laughs> ha, bubby people? Bubby people? <laughs> He's like, ha <laughs> people? Whatever. You don't know nothing. All right, so that's Jack for you. Um, so, <laughs> there's an old video game called You Don't Know Jack. So, popping in. All right, so here we go, ladies and gentlemen. So the issue is really straightforward. We need to know what the difference is between an SD and an EO. Did I say EO or MO? I said EO. And it's an MO. But in here it's an EO. And I'm old, so I'm going to call it an EO, but it's really an MO. Watch the other videos on MOs and you'll understand why. <sighs> that they're MOs and not more, not EOs. But Jack actually talks about it in this article, which is kind of funny. Anyway, the point being that stimulus deltas, S S deltas, sorry. S deltas are everything until they become SDs or, no, or MOs. So, um, so S, S deltas are literally S deltas. Like everything is an S delta until it becomes an SD. So what's the process of something becoming an SD? That is what you call discrimination training. Right? That seems like a really obvious thing to say, but I think we all forget it. That everything is in the, uh, the, the, the operantly speaking, so everything's an S-delta until it becomes an SD. And how does it become an SD? And this is Jack's point, discrimination training. In other words, you have to increase the probability of a response. And the presence of that, or a, a response needs to be emitted at a higher frequency in the presence of that stimulus than without it, and reinforcement, and all, the, all that fun stuff. And I just buried the example right in there. You have to have the opportunity to perform the response in the presence of the SD and not in the presence of the SD in order to be able to demonstrate that it's actually an SD that's controlling your behavior because if it's not, and most of it probably isn't, it's really an MO. You can also see that in Cooper, they talk about it. They give like one sentence. It's a really simple sentence to get at, but it's really hard to understand. So um, the other thing that, so that's, we'll just put that aside for a minute because I can come back and talk about that in a sec, but here we go. The other thing that I really liked about the implications in this article is that a reinforcer <laughs> must reinforce outside of that particular three-term contingency that you're working with. So if you've got one contingency going on, then a reinforcer, if the stimulus in that particular contingency is a reinforcer, then that reinforcer will reinforce behavior that has happened, that has, oh, wow, talking is a challenge today, that has happened in the absence of the SD. Excuse me, why? Because the reinforcer, if it only strengthens behavior in the presence of a particular stimulus, then that stimulus by definition can't be an SD. It would be a motivating operation. And wow, we get to, this is where it starts to get weird. Sidestep. We always just say, if behavior increases, it's a, it's a reinforcer. If I give you food to an organism that's been food deprived, it will be a reinforcer. We always just say that because it's easy, right? But we always forget the bigger piece of reinforcement. It's a probability. Or so, uh, when you deliver a reinforcer, it increases the probability of responding in a certain context. You have to wait to see the future. Right? You have to wait for the future to happen before you find out if a particular stimulus was reinforcing. We make a lot of guesses. We do the same thing with SDs. Make a lot of guesses. So, in our practice, in our real world, in, our, in, in, in life, I think we tend to think of anything that happens right before a behavior reliably as an SD for that behavior. The problem is, is that a lot of times it's not, and that's what Jack talks about in here, and he's got some really good examples of it. So the one example I want to go over is the shock termination. This is the same example I believe in Cooper, at least it was years ago, I don't know if it still is. And the reason it's in Cooper is because it's in this article. It's a really easy example to understand. Um, 
Hold on. Ladies and gentlemen, when your garage is right next to your studio, you have the access to all sorts of cool stuff. And for those of you that don't know what this is, let me turn around this way so you don't see all the scary bits. This would be an opera chamber. Eh, do we need to plug it in? I guess not. We do, we do. No, it's it. All right. <laughs> Behavior analysis is old. <laughs> um, wow, it's dusty. All right, so. See these little, the little critter goes in here, all right? So, check focus, all right, there we go. So the critter goes in there, hey critter. So um, you put the rat or whatever in there and there's a light in there, it actually all works. Um, I'm not gonna plug it in because that's not the point of the example. The point of the example is, um, Jack Michael talks about termination of shock, right? So for those of you that wonder where the shock happens in the operant chamber, it's those little metal bars down the bottom. They're electrified. You saw the wires on the other side. They're green and red because Christmassy. Um, Happy holiday. <laughs> I don't know if I like this anymore. All right, so. Oh, oh, oh. Ah. <laughs> so in the example that Jack gives, so we talk about, so the shock happens, right? So the idea is that the shock is happening, you can terminate that or delay it or whatever by providing a response in the lever. There's a lever in here, right? So this one. Okay, so there's a light that would be on and we'll come back to that light in a second. So um, so the shock will go off um, and then the organism can terminate the shock and or delay it by pressing the lever, this one. Love it, such a nice sound. Um, then, so the shock goes away. So you would think that, okay, the shock going away is a negative reinforcer. Um, so the shock happening is probably the SD for the, sh for the response. Um, why would you be wrong? Think about it. The shock happening is not the discriminative stimulus. That's the motivating operation. Because you're not gonna provide the lever press outside. You've learned to provide the lever press only in the presence of the shock. You're not gonna do the lever press without the shock. Like it's not, it's because there's not gonna be a reinforcer because there's nothing to reinforce you for because it did not, you're not escaping or getting away from anything or avoiding anything. <sighs> so shock in this case is not the discriminative stimulus because the response doesn't happen in its absence. Like, so, but it seems like it. Why? Because the shock came right before the behavior. Of lever press. So anyway, um, so Jack goes on to talk about a few other things, uh, but it's really, really, imp that's the wrong article, but it's really, really important for you to know that you need to be cautious if you're describing something as a discriminative stimulus, because you need evidence that the thing was actually a discriminative stimulus. So, all right. And um, that's what I got. Sorry for the bastardization of Jack Michael in such a short video, but ladies and gentlemen, this is actually an opera chamber. We might do a video on it. Um, and it actually works. So. Does it lever work? The lever? Yeah, try the lever. Should I plug it in first? Just, just try the lever. Well, you heard it. <laughs> I, I... Hold on. Oh, they're gooey. Oh no, they're oh, they're crumbly. There was pellets in there. I actually had real pellets from back in the day. Ah, oh, they're crumbling up. Ah, you can't see them, but there's pellets. There you go. That's the. Powdery poop. Ooh! Poop tray! <laughs> it's a poop tray! <laughs> so. <laughs> As I don't got up to get the food. Brilliant. Um, so, if you really want to know, folks, so this thing's the hopper. Or, sorry, um, this is the magazine. Hopper's down there where the food goes. Um, poop tray, we've already covered that. Um, this is, you electrify this thing. If I had this turned on, I could actually lecture for you so you could understand. Maybe we'll actually come back and do a little quick video on that. So, alright, we'll do that later. So, there you go. See ya.